For this lesson today, I want to discuss a little bit about some sheet metal careers that can uh, be employed in uh, the HVAC industry and in other areas. In the HVAC alone, uh, it is a big part of the trade. In fact, and in many ways, it's actually its own trade. Um, that's what kind of what makes HVAC such a diverse trade to get into. You can yeah, you know, focus on one area or you can focus on multiple areas of the trade. But in HVAC alone, people who work with the sheet metal are the ones that are going to design it. Uh, we're going to be the ones that lay it out, we're fabricating it, and we're the ones that are going to install it. Uh, we, sheet metal is basically on every uh, piece of HVAC equipment that's out there. But in order to become a sheet metal uh, mechanic, you have to be trained in one or two areas of sheet metal, or like I said before, you can be trained in all aspects of it. But during the design process of uh, sheet metal, workers need to be able to read, they need to be able to interpret blueprints, uh, specifications, they, uh, they need to be able to use in some cases even a CAD program because we have uh, laser uh, jet fabrication type uh, machinery out there that will actually uh, cut the metal for us so that we don't have to necessarily do it by hand. So there's a lot of areas that you, you would have to become accustomed to and, and learn. So in understanding all that information, you have to be able to work uh, and determine the sequence and methods to use when you're actually fabricating, assembling, and installing this piece of sheet metal. Where does it go? Um, is it in a conditioned space? Is it not in the conditioned space? Does it have to be insulated? Does it not have to be insulated? Stuff like that. Uh, we also need to be able to select the correct gauge metal that is going to be used for that particular product. Because uh, remember, I mean, ductwork is what's going to be supplying the air to the spaces of a, a building or home. So if we have too much static pressure in a, a a building and we're not using the correct gauge metal, you know, you can run the risk of the ductwork actually breaking apart. Uh, so you, you got to know some specific areas of what's what's going to be done. But during the layout pro phase of it all, workers use their knowledge uh, to understand uh, layout techniques and develop patterns. Uh, we use dimensions and reference lines from the patterns, and then we mark those out on the metal and then proceed to cut it out and make it an actual pattern to what we're trying to do. So when we're making those patterns, you're going to be using tools. Uh, you got to know how to read a ruler. You need to use proper sheet metal tools, a scribe. Uh, you're going to need to use awls. You're going to be using all sorts of different sheet metal cutting devices, brakes, uh, sheet metal snips, bulldogs, all benders, all sorts of stuff to make these patterns. During the fabrication process, those parts are going to be cut out, they are stamped out, and then assembled. All patterns are measured, okay, like there's an old saying, you know, measure twice, cut once. We're going to do that even with sheet metal because you don't want to be wasting material because obviously when you're wasting material, it's you're wasting money. So we want to make sure that the patterns and everything is measured correctly before we start to cut out the pieces and assembling them. So each piece is going to be cut out. It's going to be put together. It's going to be bent if it has to. If you're making an elbow or a T or something like that, you're going to have to bend it and connect it. Okay, you're going to be using bolts, you're going to be using screws, in some cases you may even have to weld ductwork together, uh, you're going to be using rivets, uh, you're going to be using angle iron, unistrut, all sorts of stuff to hang and support ductwork, so all of these areas you need to have a basic knowledge of how to use and how to do it properly. Fabrication may be done in the shop or in some cases actually be done on the job site depending on uh, what's being completed. Uh, there are companies out there that have 
basically a mobile sheet metal shop that will bring the trailer to the job site. It's going to have the sheet metal brake. It's going to have sheet metal. It's going to have tools and all sorts of stuff on it so that you can actually fabricate ductwork right there on the job site. Uh, some of those pieces will be assembled in the shop. Sometimes they won't be, uh, depending on the size, because uh, some size of ductwork can get pretty, pretty large to where you're actually able to stand up in them and because the, they're using a lot of velocity and a lot of airflow. But once all the pieces are put together and, and shipped out to the job site, then the installation can begin. Uh, individual pieces are going to be then put together and put into place to create that finished product. Therefore, we're going to have our HVAC duct system. Okay, Roofing systems. Uh, gutters, downspouts are usually fabricated and assembled and installed entirely on the job site. Uh, guys that have done that for for jobs know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, in HVAC, we usually use downspouts for gutters to kind of hide um, line sets and stuff like that from on the outside of a building so it kind of looks a little bit more neat and a little more professional because you know there's some people out there that don't exactly like to see big pipes running up the side of their house so in order to do that you use a piece of downspout to cover up the the line set then you have your fucking then you have your um, pieces of sheet metal like this. I mean, this is a complete piece of uh, ductwork where your supplies and your returns. You also have um, cross breaks in these um, in this picture. Uh, the reason by what we call a cross break is if you look at this piece of metal here, you'll see an X. This cross break is meant to strengthen the ductwork so that it's not so flimsy and when duct and air passes through it, it doesn't expand and contract and cause that popping sound that sometimes you hear when an air conditioner comes on or or something like that. But this is a given a really good example of how uh, ductwork gets put together with all different sorts of fittings. I mean, you have an offset right here. You have um, a transition piece right here. Here's your 90 degrees. All, all over. It's a really good uh, picture to show you how stuff can actually get put together. But when we're dealing with uh, sheet metal, the work environment can be a little bit hazardous, so to speak. You can um, have a lot of sharp edges. Um, remember, remind you that sheet metal is very sharp. Um, if you are not very careful, it can cut you really bad. In fact, to this day, I think I still have some scars on my hands from, from sheet metal work. So when we're dealing with the sheet metal, we got to be really mindful that we're using it the proper way and holding it the proper way, okay, because it can, it can definitely hurt us. Um, we can also get burns from it if we're welding it. Uh, so obviously you got to make sure that you have your welding goggles on, your gloves and all that stuff. Uh, you're going to be hanging ductwork off of ladders, scaffolding, lifts. So you're going to have to make sure that you're not uh, afraid of heights in some cases. You're going to have to have fall protection on hard hats, safety glasses, all those things when we're dealing with sheet metal. <coughs> Workers need to follow all proper safety procedures and be alert and cautious at all times when they're on a job site because if anybody that has had any experience on a job site, especially construction, it can get a little bit crazy because people are going all different directions and holes are being drilled and, and walls are getting put up and all sorts of stuff. So you've got to be very alert and cautious of what you're doing. Work on the job site will expose you to extreme weather. It could be freezing cold or it could be scorching hot in, uh, on the job site. You will be working inside. You're going to be working outside. You're going to be working in basements. You're going to be working in hot attics. However, a building under construction in some cases may not even have the heat or air conditioning even installed into it yet. Uh, that's going to be your job. Okay, In the wintertime, that ductwork can be very, very cold. Okay, So you got to make sure that you're wearing the proper handwear. When it's uh, finished, 
workers will conduct their work in a warehouse in some cases, attics, or on even on a roof. Uh, sheet metal work is very physically demanding. You're going to do a lot of bending. You're going to be standing for long periods of time. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of heavy lifting uh, when you're dealing with finished pieces. Zuck works in some cases is not light. It does have some weight to it, especially if they're heavy or gauge. You will be consider uh, you'll be doing a lot of bending, a lot of lifting, a lot of of climbing up and down ladders, extension ladders, lifts. Like I said. Okay, so you're going to be in close quarters in some cases. So if you are claustrophobic, it's probably not exactly the best uh, trade in some cases for you. Um, you're going to be put in awkward positions. You're going to have to bend and, and try to maneuver your body into tight areas in some cases. Sheet metal workers uh, in the manufacturing industry are subjective to re repetitive motions and are in somewhat unchanged environments. In sheet metal workers, you've got to be able to learn the trade. Uh, you've got to be able to listen. You've got to be able to follow directions uh, when you are working with a contractor uh, who is willing to provide that training for you or by entering an apprenticeship program that provides formal training for you. Uh, on the job training provided by a contractor is usually informal. It's usually a, a you go out to the person with the job and you're you're the helper of of that mechanic and what they're expecting you to do is to watch learn and and follow what they're doing and in hopes that you are grasping uh, the skills that is needed to do the job uh, you can always go to a, a trade school where obviously you can learn some stuff in a formal classroom um, but you could also learn an awful lot when you're actually out in the field working on an actual job site and and seeing what is actually being done and how it's being done. Uh, helpers usually all they do when they're on the job site they observe and help that experienced worker while learning about the material and the tools. Uh, you're technically the gopher. And so, in so many cases, it's hey, go get me, go get me some screws, go get me my drill, go get me, go get me, go get me. Um, but while you're doing that, you should be there watching and learning what is actually happening. And as you learn, hopefully your skills will improve. And they are, and obviously, the more you improve, the more you're actually allowed to kind of work on your own and eventually start doing more complicated tasks. Uh, but eventually what your, your goal would be is to become a licensed mechanic or a journeyman. But in order to do that, you have to have your apprenticeship and you must pass the written uh, licensing exam that you're going to have to take in order to technically become a technician. Okay, so once you upon you, uh, you complete your apprenticeship, you now register to go and take your your license, uh, in this case for sheet metal, it would be like an SM2 uh, journeyman technician, uh, and that's basically a limited uh, sheet metal journeyman's license. Uh, many sheet metal contractors consider an apprenticeship as the best way to learn the trade. Uh, and depending on the license that you are going for, that apprenticeship can be anywhere between two and four years of on the job comprehensive training and some classroom um, instruction if that stuff is actually uh, given. Now, mind you, different states, different uh, different states usually have different requirements for different uh, areas of the trade. So you would actually have to check with um, your local areas to find out what is needed to be done in order for you to uh, achieve a license if it's actually needed in that particular area. Again, states are different. They may not have or may not require you to have a like a sheet metal license. Uh, maybe they'll just require you to have a burner license or whatever, but you would have to just double check and look uh, at what is needed in your area. For the state of Connecticut, uh, yeah, you need to have an apprenticeship. Uh, you need to be uh, a license. You got to be able to pass the test and get your actual formal license 
in order to become what we consider a journeyman. So this is taken right from the testing center that uh, administers uh, a lot of the licensing exams in Connecticut and it kind of gives you a breakdown of what uh, is needed and what you need to know in order to pass the exam for in this case the SM2 license uh, is 60 questions you need at least a 70 to pass it and it's time limit of two hours uh, and it gives you a little bit of a breakdown of what is uh, going to be asked. Notice it doesn't tell you a specific what it's going to be, but it does tell you the areas that uh, you will be questioned on. Obviously 36 questions is going to be simply on ducts. Then you're going to have four questions at least on print reading, general knowledge, uh, kitchen hoods, ventilation, so on and so forth. You're going to have safety, you're going to need to know a little bit about welding, uh, stuff like that with the state of Connecticut. A lot of the books and these tests are open book, but that does not necessarily mean that these tests are easy. Um, the tests are very difficult. Uh, for me, my own experience when it came to taking these tests, I actually failed my licensing exam twice, um, even though they were open book. So it does give you, uh, it is a challenge. You've got to be able to understand and interpret the questions and be able to find the answers quickly uh, in the allowable books that you can actually bring in to the test. So you are able to bring in for specifically this exam, you are actually able to bring in the International Mechanical Code Book. You can bring in the NFPA 96, the NFPA 90A, uh, Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, these types of books you are able to bring in, but that does not mean that the questions are, are easy. Uh, you got to be able to quickly find uh, the code that they are referencing. Uh, in a relatively quick amount of time. Uh, so what's really good and what is recommended, especially by me, is that if you get these books, spend some time, get familiar with them, um, especially in the areas of the area that you're trying to uh, get the license for. So when you're there, uh, you are responsible for bringing your own references to the exam center. If you don't have the book, hey, oh well. Uh, your references can be highlighted, they can be underlined, they can be annotated, or they can be indexed prior to the examination session. Okay. However, you are not allowed whatsoever to do any sort of writing during the exam. Uh, they will give you just one scrap piece of paper and that scrap piece of paper is just for you to maybe do any sort of formula uh, math work or something like that or maybe just to jot down a question that you might want to skip um, but other than that you're not going to be allowed to do any other uh, writing whatsoever uh, any candidate caught writing is going to, uh, in the references uh, during the exam, we'll have those references confiscated. Yes, you are being watched. Uh, there is a camera that literally stands right in your face and there's a person on the other side of the wall that is watching everything that everybody's doing in the testing room. Okay, it's not just you, it's gonna be a bunch of people in the room. Uh, so you're gonna be watched. If you're caught doing anything that you're not supposed to do, they come in and they're going to confiscate whatever it is that you're not supposed to have and in some cases you may actually be uh, removed from the testing center and uh, you're going to have to reschedule uh, another test date at another time which is another set of fees and all that other stuff so be careful don't do anything stupid really um, if you have any sort of temporary tabs such as post-it notes or anything like that in your book. Uh, those are not going to be allowed. The proctor is going to take those post-it notes and he's just going to rip them right out of the book. Um, it, they're very, very strict when it comes to the testing. So best thing to do, as I can say, is just try to uh, find and get familiar with the books that you 
uh, may need to bring in. Another side note with all of this, just because you're able to bring in these books does not mean that those are the only books that they take questions out of. Uh, the Modern Refrigeration book is a, a book that I know that they do take questions out of. Uh, so you are got to be familiar with the Modern Refrigeration book, uh, especially some general knowledge uh, questions like general safety, shit like that. Um, but other than that, it's it's pretty uh, pretty pretty standard, I guess, is what we're looking for. So once you get your sheet metal license, you may perform such work only while under the employ of a contractor. Okay, a person that holds an SM1. Okay, the holder of that SM1 may perform only work limited to the install, erection, replacement, repair, or alteration of any ductwork system both furious and non furious for ductwork systems of any size and type, okay, excluding pneumatic conveyance systems. Okay, so basically the sheet metal uh, contractor, he can work on anything sheet metal, really. Uh, with the SM2, you're supposed to be under the employ of a contractor uh, when you're dealing with, with sheet metal. Sheet metal workers are often going to choose to specialize in a specific area of sheet metal construction and obviously there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, if you like to be those types of guys that like to be artistic, you can get into the architectural end of stuff. Uh, you can do sheet metal detailing, you can do sign fabrication, or you can be the sheet metal worker that does the residential and commercial construction. Uh, you can also become a tab technician. Uh, which is a sheet metal worker who specializes in nothing more than testing, adjusting, and balancing existing HVAC systems. Uh, that's a pretty nice little gig where you walk around with a volometer and an air balance hood and maybe a computer and you take readings uh, and fill out a report and you just adjust the airflow to specific areas of a room to make sure that the system is balanced. You know, a properly balanced system will make the system run more efficiently and run less chances of it having problems in the future. So in order to become a sheet metal apprentice, you obviously have to be in good physical condition because that work is strenuous. Uh, you know, you don't want to have bad backs, you don't want to have bad knees, bad shoulders, stuff like that. You want to be in physically good condition. Uh, they should enjoy working with their hands, have good hand-eye coordination. I mean, obviously, you are going to be working with stuff that's sharp. You're going to be working with hammers, rivets, drills, and all that stuff. I don't think we want to be on a job site and smashing our thumb 15 times or drilling through our thumb. So, obviously, you got to be able to be coordinated with your eyes and your hands. Uh, you got to have good mechanical and math skills because, like I said, you're going to be dealing with rulers. You're going to be dealing with measurements, heights, all the sorts of stuff. Okay, courses in algebra, trigonometry, mechanical drawings is a great addition to learning the trade and being able to fabricate because you are going to be dealing with angles. Yes, algebra is a part of it. Uh, being able to read a mechanical drawing blueprint is something that is extremely important because you got to be able to know where the ductwork is actually going to go and how it's supposed to get there. Uh, over 80% of the sheet metal workers are employed in either the construction related industries or in manufacturing. Your construction related industries include residential and commercial building constructions, HVAC, kitchen, equipment design, your manufacturing stuff is like your automobile and your airline assembly lines and stuff like that. 